As we begin this morning, I would like to invite you, if you're able, to stand and join me as we sing the first and final verse of Victory in Jesus. Chad Hickson. I'm the pastor here at Rehoboth Baptist Church. On behalf of our church uh, and church family, uh, we express our gratitude for you being here and for uh, our ability to be a part uh, of this occasion. I want to read the obituary. Robert Terry Everett was born February 15, 1937 and passed from this world on March the 12th 2024. A native and lifelong resident of the Wiregrass passed away peacefully Tuesday morning at his home in Rehoboth. Terry was preceded in death by his parents, Dewey Roberts and Thelma May Fowler Everett, his brother Jared Everett, and his sister Bobby Jean Smith. He is survived by his wife of 54 years, Barbara Pitts Everett. He is also survived by his brother Ronnie Everett, Sally, and several nieces and nephews. Terry was born at Moody Hospital in Dothan, grew up in Midland City, and graduated from Midland City High School. Afterwards, he enlisted in the U.S. Air Force and served four years from 1955 to 1959 as an intelligence specialist, eventually gaining top-secret clearance in West Germany. After leaving the Air Force, Terry lived for 31 years in Enterprise and the remainder of his life in the Dothan area, Rehoboth. Following his military service, Terry returned to Dothan where he worked as a a sports and police beat writer for the Dothan Eagle. He married Barbara Pitts in 1969 Together, they embarked upon publishing and owning numerous daily and weekly newspaper publications in several states before selling the remaining paper, the Union Springs Herald, in 2003. 
Terry served as chair of the board of the Alabama Press Association and the board of directors of the Dothan Federal Savings Bank. He was also an active small businessman serving as president, owner, and operator of Everett Farms, uh, Premium Home Builders, and the Everett Land Development Company and Enterprise. Following the retirement of Alabama 2nd District Congressman Bill Dickinson in 1992, Terry ran for the open congressional seat and, de and defeated State Senator Larry Dixon in the Republican primary. He went on to, to beat State Treasurer George C. Wallace Jr. in the general election. While in Congress, he served on the Agricultural Committee, Armed Services Committee, the Premium Select Committee on Intelligence, and the Veterans Affairs Committee. He was one of the only a handful of House members to serve on four major committees simultaneously. During his 16-year tenure in the U.S. House, he took a leading role in protecting Southeast peanut farmers, chairing the Special Crops and Foreign Agricultural Programs subcommittee where he authored portions of the 2002 Farm Bill in support, support of peanut growers. On the Armed Services Committee, he stood firmly behind uh, Southeast Alabama's military bases, including Fort Rucker, uh, now known as Fort Novacell, and Maxwell Gunter Air Force Base in Montgomery. While on the Veterans Affairs Committee, he investigated the abuse of veterans in the VA hospitals and nursing homes and secured increases in ve veterans' health care spending. As the first chairman of the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Strategic Forces, he became a recognized advocate for protecting and advancing U.S. military space cap capability. Upon his retirement from Congress in 2009, Terry was chosen as the first member of Congress to participate in the Air Force Space War Games, where he played the role of president. He was also appointed by President Obama to serve on the U.S. State Department's International, uh, International Security Advisory Board. It is my pleasure to introduce to you now Mr. Mike Lewis. Mike served uh, Terry as press secretary in his years in office in Congress. And so, Mike, you come and share. Everyone? Okay, very good. Good morning. On behalf of Barbara Everett and the entire Everett family, I want to thank each of you for joining us today, live and also virtually, to honor the life of a remarkable man. Spanning some eight decades, Terry Everett dutifully performed many influential roles, husband, brother, foster dad, Sunday school teacher, uncle, friend, mentor, servant leader, patriot, follower of Christ, and many more. Ten months ago, Barbara asked me to deliver the eulogy when the day came that Terry would be called home. Admittedly, it's a tough assignment. Terry's life and impact on so many in this room and well beyond can't be adequately covered by one person in 10 to 15 minutes' time. But as Terry would say, keep it short and don't use any 50-cent words. <laughs> If you could sum up Terry's legacy in just a few words, though, it might be that he always answered the call. First, a little history. You've heard some of it in the obit, but I'll go back over it with more context. Terry was a son of the wiregrass. 87 years ago, he was born just north of here across the Dale County line in Midland City. By many accounts, he grew up fast. After he graduated Midland City High School, he joined the service and he soon took on dual roles of serving his country and his family. Each of his parents passed away as he approached milestone ages, 18 and 21, 22. 
He stepped up and helped support his younger siblings as he could, and also wore the blue uniform of the United States Air Force. It was during the height of the Cold War, the same year that the Warsaw Pact was created, that he was assigned to West Germany with the U.S. Air Force Security Service, tasked with the heady job of monitoring Soviet aircraft communications across Eastern Europe. He had to learn Russian, and he received one of the highest security clearances. Four years later, when his duty was successfully completed, he returned home, picking up where he left off and getting back to work. He took a new direction, serving the public this time as a newspaper reporter and photographer at the Dothan Eagle. This was the start of a bold and unexpected career path, along with his soon-to-be life partner and wife, Barbara, merging journalism and small business. For the next three decades, Terry and Barbara started from the humble beginnings of a small weekly shopper news publication put together in the living room of their home, forging a small empire of newspaper holdings, personally guiding each to success. As Barbara would later reflect, when Terry made up his mind to do something, he did it, no matter what. He carefully learned each new role and would take command. He soon became a quiet behind the scenes influence in their new hometown of Enterprise and a respected local newspaper publisher, small businessman and civic leader. His unwavering support for the U.S. Army Avi Aviation Center at Fort Rucker, including his publishing of the Post newspaper, The Army Flyer, caught the attention of the brass. He was nominated twice as U.S. Army Civilian of the Year. If running his growing newspaper business was enough, was not enough, Terry Everett sought and won his elected, first elected position as president and chairman of the board of the Alabama Press Association. It was in this capacity that he led groups of fellow Alabama newspaper publishers on foreign educational trips, including to Cuba, where he would sit on the front row with his video camera recording some of Fidel Castro's fiery speeches. Terry had a gift for bonding with people from completely different backgrounds and ideologies, and that would later, later serve him well in his career in Congress. He and Barbara also traveled with a national newspaper group to the Soviet Union, one of several trips he made, where they made many friends of everyday Russians, and that experience, too, would later come back to serve him. Meanwhile, back home, he took on additional jobs of running home construction, farming businesses, and he even dabbled in banking as the board chairman a board member of a local financial institution. Now, he was busy, to be sure, and successful, but he felt like he was meant for more. In an interview with the late Ann Varnum, Barbara reflected on what that more would come to be. She said, one evening in early 1992, Terry and I were watching the 6 o'clock news when Congressman Bill Dickinson made the announcement that after holding Alabama's second congressional district seat for 28 years, he was finally retiring. Afterwards, Terry got up, turned the television off, looked at me, Barbara said, and he said to me, I'm going to run for Congress. As she put it, unfortunately, my first comment to him was, who will vote for you? But as with every new task he chose to undertake, she soon accepted that Terry would be successful. Troy University Chancellor Dr. Jack Hawkins recently summed up uh, best Terry's calling and feeling to run. Dr. Hawkins says, Terry didn't need the office. The office needed him. The Alabama Baptist newspaper speculated back in 92 that Terry may have made history as the first congressional candidate to open his campaign in his preacher's house. Quoting the paper, there he was with a tight circle of friends and Pastor Lawrence Phipps of Enterprise First Baptist Church committing themselves to the bumps and grinds of politics. Quoting Congress, then to be Congressman Everett, we thought and prayed about it, Everett remembered. I don't use these words likely, but I really felt led to run. I felt, I, I thought if I felt was, if the feeling I had was real, then it had to begin in prayer. For sure, the bumps and grinds, as the paper described their challenges, soon became apparent. As he began that campaign, the first polling indicated that Terry only had 4% name recognition throughout Southeast Alabama. 
That fact was made no less comforting when Barbara was quick to point out that the poll had a plus or minus accuracy rating of 4%. So Terry's true name recognition actually fell within the margin of error. In the parlance of political prognosticators, Terry's run was a long shot. But he hired an experienced team and set to work. He surprised all the pundits and even his opponents by winning the Republican primary against a well-known, well-financed challenger. But that's when the real politicking began. The bumps and grinds again would reemerge when news broke that a marijuana plant had been spotted on Terry's farm right here in Rehoboth. Soon it was revealed that the plant was a plant, if you pardon the pun, wasn't real. Terry was soon cleared, but some folks still had fun with the idea. At an Everett for Congress campaign gathering in Autauga County, Terry caught sight of an older gentleman using a walker, slowly working his way forward through the crowd. When the gentleman finally reached Terry, he said with a smile, they got your cash crop, didn't they? The general election was a historic matchup between political newcomer Terry Everett and the son of the most famous politician in Alabama history. George Wallace Jr. was the odds-on favorite, but Terry and his team, again, meticulously polled and targeted resources to where they would have greatest effect. Election night was a classic nail-biter. The whole country was watching. Political guru Bob Ingram was on television in Montgomery noting that Early returns from rural Alabama showed George Jr. in the lead. But as the evening progressed and more precincts phoned in their vote totals, the tide turned. If memory serves, Dale County's returns signaled the turning point. Terry ultimately found himself on top with 49.5% to Wallace's 47.9. Terry's victory over Wallace garnered national attention with ABC News showing up at his enterprise office the next day. When you Google Terry Everett, he is identified as an American politician, but he wasn't a politician. His original campaign theme was send a message, not a politician. And he often told everyone that he was a populist. A people first approach to governing was his style. And as a freshman member of Congress, he took that hard work ethic to Washington. He hit the ground running. He created an index card file of over 434 of his fellow congressmen and their committee assignments, and he began to form friendships and build support right away. No one was a stranger to Terry. He quickly achieved the goal of landing seats on the influential House Armed Services and Agriculture Committees so he could fight for funding for local military base advancement enhancement projects and ensure that Alabama's farmers' interested, interests were protected. But there were some lighter moments, too. For example, as a newly elected member of Congress, he was called one day to lead the House of Representatives in the Pledge of Allegiance, the normal way that the House begins its legislative business. As he stood in the well of the House at the microphone, much like this here, he realized there are hundreds or thousands of people watching me on C-SPAN right now. He froze until the speaker behind him finally said into his mic, I pledge <laughs> to nudge him on. He did fine after that. During his eight terms in Congress, Terry formed coalitions with both Republicans and Democrats when necessary to protect American jobs. He was never shy to reach across the political aisle if the goal required it, and he often found that the other side would respond in kind, a message for today, in fact. Not long after arriving in D.C., he and Barbara were invited to the White House to join other members of Congress in meeting the newly elected president and vice president and their wives. As Terry proceeded through the line to meet Vice President Al Gore, he reminded Mr. Gore that as a young army officer in the early 1970s, Gore worked at the Army Flyer newspaper while stationed at Fort Rucker, Alabama, and that Terry had in effect been his boss. <laughs> vice President Gore, not to miss a beat, said he remembered it well. The unlikely associations didn't end there. One day on the House floor, Terry and Pensacola Democrat Earl Hutto, well known to many of us, were talking about how each had lived in a small section house on Kelly Street in Midland City while they were boys. First it was Hutto living there, and then Terry. 
It was a, already a remarkable story, but they were soon joined on the floor by their mutual friend, colleague Republican Congressman Jerry Solomon of Glen Falls, New York, upstate New York. And then he asked the two, what are you guys talking about? Terry deadpanned, well, we're just reminiscing about having lived in Midland City at, uh, you know, in our childhood. And he said to Solomon, you wouldn't know anything about that. And they got a shock when Solomon fired back, well, you don't know where I'm from, do you? I'm from Echo. For those of you who are not from this area, Echo is 10 miles due north of Midland City off Highway 67. Terry, Hutto, and Solomon soon dubbed themselves the Dale County Boys, and Everett was convinced that this was the only county in the country that had three members, seated members of Congress from, from its area. And also remember the reference I made earlier to Terry, one of Terry and Barbara's visits to Russia. A few years after Terry was sworn into the U.S. House, he was invited to join in an official congressional meeting welcoming in the Capitol building, the newly elected president of the Republic of Georgia, a former Soviet Republic, I might add, as Terry reached out and shook the hand of then Georgian President Edward Shevardnadze. He also presented the visiting dignitary with several small bags of Alabama peanuts. Shevardnadze, who had previously held the lofty post as foreign minister of the Soviet Union, not only remembered Terry from a previous meeting in Moscow, but had recalled Terry handed him peanuts back then, too. As a side note, Terry was helping the Alabama peanut producers in promoting the export of our wonderful, delicious peanuts as a source of nutrition for Russian children. And speaking of presidents, we can't forget the time that Terry and Senator Jeff Sessions joined President George W. Bush on a flight from Washington here to Alabama. As the three sat together, Terry asked if he could use one of the telephones aboard Air Force One to call Barbara. After she was on the line, Bush took the phone away from Terry and says, hello, Barbara, this is your president speaking. To which she replied, oh yeah, right. <laughs> she later learned it wasn't a joke. Terry accomplished so much during his time in Congress as Dothan businessman Charles Nalen with us here today said on TV the other night, Terry was a four-star general in the war on wood to modernize Fort Rucker, now Fort Novacell. Terry literally transformed, he wasn't kidding, Ted, Terry literally transformed the look of that installation. He also protected the peanut industry and fought for our taxpayers. He always considered himself a voice of the average citizen. But aside from his work, Terry probably will be most remembered for his soft-spoken style, common-sense approach to governing. He was never flashy, never a showboat. He always just got things done. He was always someone who, he was always someone who really was what he appeared to be. There was, there's no pretense. And that was a, a trait that he shared with one of his best friends in Congress, a fellow Alabama congressman from Mobile, Sonny Callahan of the 1st District. In, in 2001, when their colleague, former then Congressman Joe Moakley, a longtime liberal Democrat from Massachusetts, passed away, a special memorial was held on the House floor. One of Moakley's comments, Congressman, Democrat Congressman Richard Neal from Massachusetts, remarked in the House floor, Moakley was an old school Democrat, but do you know what? Do you know who he liked to have dinner with in the evenings? And I'm continuing to quote Congressman Neal. This is going to kill them in Alabama as they, when they find out, the voters in Alabama, Moakley liked to dine with Sonny Callahan and Terry Everett. That was the group he assembled with after hours. He enjoyed their company socially and loved their stories about Alabama and how they had come to Washington. As we remember Terry, we cannot overlook the most important person in his life the love of his life, Barbara. She was not only essential to his success in business and in Congress and in everything that he did and accomplished together, but he was, she was also essential in his lifelong personal happiness. As our dear friend John Parrish has reminded us, she devoted so much love and support to Terry and incredibly even more recently, there is no doubt that he is looking down and smiling on her right now, along with his beloved dog, Sydney, standing by his side. God bless you all. Thank you.
sat there and listen to Mike, I couldn't help but think about the fact that all of that sounds like a fairy tale. I mean, really uh, remarkable, extraordinary life. Uh, the details uh, bring back just a, a vivid picture of such a charmed life in so many ways. And, uh, and as far as fairy tales go, one of the things that really we need to remind ourselves today, I think it's very important actually, is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a fairy tale. It's true. It is historically, reliably, verifiably true. And on a day like today, we need to understand how good that news is. You see, 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus Christ came to this earth. He was really like, un, unlike, I should say, any other man that had ever been here. You see, Christ came as God in human flesh. 
And he lived like no one else. In fact, his record was unblemished. Now, I just have to think for a moment. When you ask Terry, who's going to vote for you? (laughs) I'm wondering if he thought, well, I hope you do, Barbara. (laughs) At least one, right? Um, If you think about Jesus Christ, he really is and represents the one. Because no one else, no one else did what he could do. Perfect, unblemished, righteous record. I think about Terry's uh, accomplishments, all that he did, what he, what he did for our nation, uh, what he did for our state and, and this particular community, all those accomplishments. One thing Terry could not accomplish by himself, and that was salvation. You see, salvation is not achieved It's received. In the sense, it is achieved, but it was achieved by Christ. And what He did, completely, exclusively coming to live a right life and die on a cross as a substitute. Three days later, historically, verifiably, witnessed as He rose from death to life. And that really changed the course of history. Christians have held that this is not a a, a story, a bedtime story, where we read and everyone lived happily ever after. We believe this to be true. We believe the Bible is not just a good book. We believe that the Bible is true. That these stories of Jesus were actual events and we put our hope in these things. And on days like today, it's a good reminder That the best of men, and I would include Terry among that, the best of men are men at best. And all men, listen to me, all men need Jesus. Every one of us. There is no exception to that rule. No matter how accomplished you are, no matter where you land in this world, everyone has a need for one who was like, No one else. You you imagine the transition that must have taken place between Washington and Rehoboth, Alabama. (laughs) Um, I I often ask myself the question, uh, you know, why why Rehoboth? And, And I've come to this conclusion that Rehoboth is about as far from D.C. as you can possibly get. (laughs) And I think Terry did that intentionally. Um, If you knew him, and I knew him uh, for a a, a short season of his life, Uh, I was his pastor, he and Barbara sat over there, Uh, they would come. What he didn't want was to be spotlighted. He had stood in the spotlight, he had been recognized, he had done his thing, and now he wanted to kind of blend in with all that was. He, He didn't want to be the center of attention and worship, he really really wanted to make Jesus the center of attention in the worship service. I remember talking to him and just being, being impressed, but, but he was not a man of, of many words. In fact, I would uh, say that he, he spoke with an economy of words. He was brief. He, he wasn't afflicted by what afflicts most Baptist preachers today. Uh, He was definitely a man of few words, but he was a man of action. And it's interesting as I think about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there is, there's a call for us to engage the gospel, to act on it. It's not just information that we hear and believe, but there's actually a truth to be embraced. Listen to Paul's writings as he writes To young Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called 
and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and for Christ Jesus, who is His testimony before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, which He will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and forever sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to Him be honor and eternal dominion forever. You probably know the context of this. It's called a pastoral epistle, and it was written by Paul, who is uh, uh, mentoring his uh, son in the faith, Timothy. And, And as he spoke into the context of Timothy giving leadership to the church at Ephesus, he gave him some, uh, what I would call, marching orders. He gave him, gave him some things to do. So, some things to, to embrace, if you will. And he characterizes the gospel in, in ways that, that call for action. L- listen to how these, these are described. He says, pursue righteousness. Fight the good fight of faith. Hold, take hold of eternal life, he says. Uh, He says, uh, keep the commandment unstained. Make the good confession. All of these are actions. If if, if you want to describe Terry, just, just reality. He didn't say a lot, but he sure did do a lot. I'm impressed with a man who is able to wield himself the way he was for good and for our nation. One of the greatest uh, privileges that we have as a nation is the privilege of the freedom of worship. And every Sunday, up until Terry's health began to fail, he and Barbara sat over there, and they worshipped. And they engaged in that <laughs> chief of all uh, uh, actions as far as we as Americans are able to do. And that is to hold to the freedom of worship. Terry was a man of action. He took action in his life. But the gospel calls for action. Listen to me. I, I don't know really where you come from in your life. I don't know your story. We hear Terry's story, and it's quite a remarkable story. He and Barbara sat in my office. I listened to their testimony about their faith in Jesus Christ. I heard about how they served Christ in their lives in very practical ways. Barbara was telling me that um, particular home that they owned an enterprise had a very steep backyard the backyard sloped she was in charge of grass cutting back then and uh well you can imagine the 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 kind of elbow grease it takes to make that work so she devised a scheme by which a pool would be installed in their backyard uh, this was purely ministry, I mean, purely uh, uh, aesthetics and, and all those things, but it served a, a dual purpose. One she probably didn't see on the front end of this. It was a purpose to kind of alleviate that burden, but, you know, God used a very practical thing like a pool to begin a ministry to students in the enterprise area. And those students began to come to their home. They made Uh, made themselves welcome, opened the doors to kids from all over the place. Some knew Jesus, some came to to know Jesus through that ministry. And you can imagine what that must have been like. I mean, when you invite kids into your home, well, well, okay, so let's just think about that. 
Terry had rules. <laughs> Barbara was saying that uh, he would lay down the rules. He held them accountable to those rules. And you know what? They respected them for that. And those two in that house ministered to kids in ways and touched kids and their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ in ways that probably we will never fully understand this side of glory. What a blessing and privilege it is to think about how God uses just the little tangible things. Again, I would say this, that that if you want to understand Terry, look at his life. Look what he did. Remind yourself of his actions that he took, how he lived, how he practiced. 54 years of marriage. That's a great testimony, Barbara. That is a great testimony. I, uh, I, when I counsel young or newly married couples or couples to be married, one of the things that I tell them up front is that marriage is always easy. It, it's easy. I, 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 I that, just make that universal statement and, and, uh, and I, I, I begin to tell them to make sure that they understand that if the person that they're marrying and living with is as easy to live with as you are, then it'll be just easy, right? And here, here's the reality of, of this, is that it's a testament to the grace of God that two people commit themselves to each other for a lifetime. Thank you, Barbara, for that example. Thank you and Terry for showing us a picture of Christ in that of faithfulness, of commitment, of keeping your vows. I I, I tell you, I greatly appreciate that. Terry was a man of action. The gospel wasn't just information in his head. It was conviction in his life. I don't mean to say that he was perfect. Please don't, don't hear that. None of us are. Jesus alone is perfect. And we are all saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But when you experience real faith, it changes you. It sets you on a new trajectory in life, if you will. And for Terry and Barbara, it meant that their their door would be open. And and, and their, their house would be a home to kids from all over. And what a beautiful picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel's true, so embrace it. Uh, There's one more thing I'd share with you before we close out our time today. And that's this. The gospel is true, so lean on it. In this text, Paul is giving, he's giving young Timothy some really strong advice about what it looks like to live for Christ in a world that is not for Christ. In a world that may not be pro-Christian, pro-Jesus. A a world that may not be for righteousness, for justice, for the things that undergird the Christian morality. Paul is telling young Timothy how he is to live out in a world that is, here it is, broken. We don't have to look hard or look far to understand that there is something, there's something wrong with our world. You see it on TV. We read it in our, our feeds and, and the information that hits us so often to understand that there's something profoundly wrong in our world system. The world is, in a way, broken. It's the things that are just ought not to be. We find this in a physical sense. As you think about about Terry and the physical decline that he experienced in the latter days of his life. We see the brokenness as far as war and how it rages. Poverty and suffering multiplied all around the world. And we, we stand here today and we honor a man. But as we do, we're reminded that But this is not the way it ought to be. You see, 
We weren't created primarily to live and die, but to live. In fact, this text emphasizes what, what, what Paul teaches young Timothy. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. We were created for eternity. And so as we stand here today, it's a constant reminder that the way things are is not the way things ought to be. Now, there's a lot of explanations today as to why. Some would say... Um, it's basically a, an educational issue. We need to teach and train and instruct. And look, I, I'm pro education. Like, I, I, you know, we, we need education. But education won't fix everything. Some say, well, you, you know, you gotta, you gotta kind of equip the family a, a better or change the cultural dynamics. And all of that's true and helpful. Some say the way to fix it is to fix Washington. <laughs> uh, Derry did his best in that. But listen to me. The reason things are the way they are is because in the beginning, first two on planet earth rebelled against a holy God and set the world into what is called a fall. And this world has been broken ever since. But the Christian conviction is that one day, our God is going to change this old world and make it new again. In fact, we are told in this particular text that Jesus Christ will one day come again. As we we arrive at this moment and think about the, the, the fact that it is appointed unto man once to die and then comes the judgment. And for us, this moment seems so stark, somewhat harsh. It seems as if death has won. And you need to hear this. Because this is the good news of the gospel. Death does not have the last word. Jesus does. And scripture teaches us. That the Christ who came. And lived a perfect and righteous life. Stretched out his arms on a Roman cross. 2,000 years ago. Was laid in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day stood up. And walked out bodily who has ascended to heaven, that same Jesus is going to come again. And our hope is that the one who beat death is the one who will call the graves to open up to life. Death does not have the last word. Jesus does. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, and he makes a statement, and I just love it. He says this, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? If you don't recognize the language, it's a taunt. Okay? Um, in Rehoboth, we say it's a, it's a kind of a nanny, nanny, boo boo. <laughs> Paul throws out a theological nanny, nanny, boo boo in the face of death and says, you know what? You do not have the last word. One day Jesus is going to give a command. And the graves are going to open up. And the dead in Christ will rise again. What a hope to lean on. What a hope that this isn't final. This isn't the last word. This isn't the end. In fact, we know it's in Jesus' hand. My, my girls, I have two girls. And... Uh, when they were young, we took a trip to Atlanta, Georgia. As we went to Atlanta, one of the things that we intended to do was to visit the Georgia Aquarium. Um, and unlike Rehoboth, Atlanta has several roads. <laughs> and they're very busy. And what I learned very quickly is not all roads lead to the aquarium. You have to be on the right road. And I think if Terry were here, he would, he would want 
to encourage you. That there's a lot of roads you can choose. There's a lot of paths in this life. There's a lot of avenues and options. But there's only one right road. There's only one road that leads to hope. There's only one road that has a basis in truth, both historically and for the future. And that road, that road is a road that we can lean on. It's good news today. Barbara, friends and family, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. To serve you in this way, to minister the gospel, to share with you about a faithful man, and to know That the gospel is good news on really bright days and really difficult days. Will you bow your heads with me for prayer? Most totally righteous Father, I want to thank you for a man that served our nation, our state, our wiregrass community very well. Successful in so many ways. A charmed life, a fairy tale, if you will, God. Father, for the influence and the impact that he had, for the character that he showed, for the, the reality that, unlike most in Washington, he, he did more doing than talking. God, we, we're thankful for the fingerprints of Terry in our community, in our state, and nation. And today, I am so thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That this gospel is not a fairy tale. It's not a, it's not a, a fictional account, a hope, a wish, a dream. It's true. And that Jesus was His a historical person that changed the world. And that when we, when we yoke our lives to Christ, the hope beyond the now to the then is coming. And so God, I pray that you would be with Miss Barbara, with friends and family, with all who knew and loved Terry. I pray that your grace would be sufficient both for today and tomorrow. Thank you for it, in Jesus' name.
Right.